Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, good to have you all back. You've all had your break time, and we're going to go into the second half hour now this afternoon. And again, for those of you on television, in case this is your first time and you're just clipping through and you wonder what in the world, we're just an informal Bible study study, and uh, that blackboard is what gets people's attention. Not me, thankfully. It's the blackboard, and uh, then they come back and have to see what it's all about. So we're glad you're with us, and again, we always like to thank you for your letters. My, how we enjoy our mail time. All right, Iris wants me to keep plugging our one and only book, because we don't want them to sit out there in the warehouse, and uh, it's 88 questions and the answers from past programs, and uh, everybody... Uh, Seems to enjoy it, especially the younger people. So uh, we want to keep reminding you of that. All right, we're going to keep right on going where we left off with what we've been calling connecting the dots. We didn't mention it in the last program, but we just sort of decided to start at Genesis, and just as they like to say lately, you just connect the dots, how everything fits from cover to cover, even though there are changes in the program, and uh, we're covering that now as we come to the Apostle Paul. And after Paul's conversion, and he spent the three years in the desert, and as we saw in our last moments of the last half hour, he came back now to Jerusalem, only spent a couple weeks with Peter and a few of the others, and then his life was threatened again, as usual. And so he fled up to the hometown of Tarsus, up there in what is presently southwestern Turkey. But now we're going to pick up back in Jerusalem once again, or at least Joppa, with Peter. <coughs> And uh, the whole thing is so providential, but most people miss it. Because, you see, Peter is still the Jew's Jew. He has no time for Gentiles, which was appropriate at that time. And uh, how shall I put it? Yet God had to let Peter know that now something different was taking place. He was going to go to the Gentiles, Peter or no Peter. And so this is what we're going to pick up now in chapter 10, that we have to, or the Lord has to show Peter that he is now going to offer salvation to the Gentile world. Now you've got to know your Old Testament to realize that Israel was never instructed to proselyze or evangelize the Gentile world. They were to keep it to themselves. They alone were under the covenants, and they would have their opportunity at some time in the future to bring Gentiles, but certainly not yet. So this whole idea of Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius now is primarily not just to save those few Gentile Romans, which is appropriate, but more importantly, to show Peter that now he was going to do something totally different. And I maintain, had Peter not had this experience, <clears throat> When they came together in the Jerusalem Council in 51 A.D., which would probably be about seven, eight years after this, no, it's 12 years after, I'm sorry, Peter would have never agreed to let Paul and Barnabas go back to their Gentile ministry. They would have squashed it right there in Jerusalem. So as we look at this event now with uh, Peter and Cornelius, keep that uppermost in your mind that this is God's way of showing Peter that he was now going to do something totally different. All right, Acts chapter 10, we'll start reading in verse 1. And there was a certain man in Caesarea, just up the coast from Jerusalem. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion or an officer of the band called the Italian band. A devout man. In other words, he was religious, contrary to most Romans who were pagan. But he was a devout man and one who feared God with all his house, Gave much alms. He was certainly, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A philanthropist. <laughs> he gave to those that needed and uh, prayed to God. Now, most people think that makes him a believer. No, that's most of the human race, see? And still he's as lost as a goose, is the way I usually put it. And uh, consequently, he was in need of salvation. And this is where God is going to start now, so far as the Gentile world is concerned. All right, now this Cornelius then, in verse 3, saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, which would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he saw an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and we looked on him, he was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? 
not recognizing that it was an angel, but whatever. And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa. Now you've got to know your uh, Mideast geography. We're down at that southern, or, yeah, the southern end of the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, it's a little further south of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem today, to Joppa. All right? Send a man to Joppa. And uh, look for one called Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, that is, of the Mediterranean, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest do. Now, we're not going to take all this verse by verse. We've done this before when we taught the book of Acts, and uh, especially for those of you out on television watching the daily program, we're back there, just finished Acts and Romans, so this is all just a real recent review for you. But anyway, now then, when... Uh, Cornelius is ready to send someone down to find Peter. The Lord, again, in his own way of doing things, also deals with Peter down there at Joppa. And uh, verse 9, On their morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, that is, the emissaries from Cornelius up at Caesarea, when they were on their journey and they drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, which is noon. And he became very hungry. It's lunchtime, as we call it today. And he would have eaten. But while they, probably the women folks, while they were making ready, he fell into a trance up there on the housetop. And he saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as there had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. And in this sheet were all manner of four-footed beasts, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air, which means it was mostly unclean stuff to a Jew. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, I always stop right here. Why does Peter say what he says? He's a law-keeping Jew. He's not about to eat any of this stuff that was not part of the clean animals. And so Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, that's all I want to see here, is that we are dealing with Peter, the law-keeping Jew. But you know what happened. Finally, uh, the Lord got through to him, and uh, Peter, of course, gives in to the Lord's leading. And about at the time he's agreeable, here come the people from Cornelius and they meet him at the front door. And so now we're jumped down to verse 23. So then he called them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter, Peter went away with them. Now we know from chapter 11 that he also took six fellow believing Jews with him for a total of seven. Boy, I was just interesting, reading an interesting book last night on numbers. You know, it's just amazing how this Bible is put together with Numbers. It's just unbelievable. And of course, that's what makes it so supernatural. But anyway, Peter Lee leaves with them, and they, uh, verse 24, the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, had called together his kinsmen, his relatives, and near friends. So we have a house full of people. How many? The Bible doesn't tell us. You can use your own uh, good sense. Remember, it's a Middle Eastern home, so it certainly wasn't commodious enough for dozens and dozens, but there could have been 12, 14, 15, maybe 20 people. All right, now we come down to verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. See, now there comes that pagan background. And uh, Peter, verse 26, Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked to them, he went in through the front door, found many that were come together, and now Peter gets kind of shaky. Peter is getting a little bit worried. And I can understand why. Because, you know, when, when religion has a hold on you, it, it's, it just controls your life. And Judaism was a religion. All right, now look what happened. When he sees all these Gentiles probably a lot of them military people. He said, you know how that it is unlawful. See how clearly this shows Peter's legalism? 
Peter says, you know that it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now you see how plain that is? That was the mentality of the nation of Israel, rightly. Because that's what God had instructed from the very beginning. Have nothing to do with these pagan, idolatrous Gentiles. They were a separated people. Oh, but now, you see, God has to show Peter that he's going to make a break with that kind of mentality. He is going to go to the Gentile world. All right, so he says it's an unlawful thing for a man as a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean because every human being is now going to be a candidate for this glorious gospel that will be coming from this other apostle. All right, verse 29. Therefore, I came unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked, therefore, for what intent you have sent for me. And then Cornelius rehearses his uh, experience with the angel and how the Lord had told him to send for him and so forth. And uh, now then, verse 33. Winding up Cornelius' little speech, he says, Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, that is, to Peter, <clears throat> and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. In other words, Cornelius says, we're hanging on every word that you're going to be telling us. All right, so Peter now begins to unfold who Jesus of Nazareth really was. See? All right, verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel. Now, never lose sight of that. Up until this time, God's word had never gone to anybody but the nation of Israel. Oh, there may have been an occasional proselyte, but I always just remind people, what did Jesus say about proselytes? Why, they were more the children of hell than the proselytes that they won, see? But anyway, verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed the devil, for God was with him. And were witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. All right, now the point I'm going to make here, and this is what so many people cannot understand, Peter is not proclaiming that death, burial, and resurrection as the means of salvation. It just isn't in here. He is establishing a fact that even though Israel had crucified their Messiah, shed his blood, he had risen from the dead, he had gone back to glory, but as we show here on our timeline all the time, so far as Peter is still concerned, this was all simply a matter of something or other that he couldn't comprehend, but... I think they understood that the atoning blood had now been shed. Consequently, the ascended Lord, in short order, after the seven years of the tribulation, they understood that he would be coming back and still bringing in the kingdom, and it would all happen in their lifetime. They had no idea. I can't keep repeating it. I can't help but repeat it. They had no idea that this was going to be opened up into a 2,000-year period of history. This was all supposed to happen in their lifetime, see? All right, now let's read on. I don't want you to lose the thought. Verse 39, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, him God raised up and showed him openly. Now verse 41, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now watch as I'm saying, not a word of salvation attached to this. It's just a statement of fact. Verse 43, to him, to this resurrected Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. A word about the blood? A word about his death? 
a word about his resurrection. Nothing. Now, do you see that? The world can't see that. They, that. Like I said in the last program, they try to tell me that Paul preached the same thing Peter did and Peter preached what Paul did. Peter has no conception of what we call salvation through the work of the cross. All Peter still understands is who he was. He was that promised Messiah. And Peter says, I don't care what happened to him. He's alive, he's in glory, and he's ready to come back and still fulfill the promises. That's what I want folks to see. And if they would believe who he was, even these Gentiles, they would receive the remission of sins. All right, that's the gospel of the kingdom. Now, that's the same message that Saul of Tarsus was saved by. Saul didn't have an understanding of the work of the cross when he was saved on the road to Damascus. All he recognized was who this Jesus of Nazareth really was. That's the kingdom gospel, see? All right, now then, when these Gentiles, these Romans, when they heard that, they were so open to it, because after all, this is God doing something beyond the normal. He's got to open the door to the Gentile world. He's got to show Peter that these Gentiles are going to be saved without going through all the ramifications of temple worship and law-keeping and repentance and water baptism and the whole bit. They're going to be saved by faith even though it's not yet Paul's gospel. See? All right, so while, verse 44, while Peter yet spake. He hasn't even finished. And here comes the evidence of the believing of these Gentiles. You see that? So while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. Why? Because they were believing it. See? With childlike faith, they were believing what Peter was saying. And God responded by showing the proof of their faith, which was common for especially that day and time, gave them the gift of speaking in other languages, verse 45, and they of the circumcision who believed, in other words, Peter and the six men that came with him, they were, now what's the word? Astonished. And what does that mean? They couldn't believe their ears. What in the world? What's happening? These pagan Gentiles are receiving the same kind of a response that we got of Pentecost. But they had to believe it. God had saved them. And that was the confirmation of their saving faith. And so out on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? For they heard them speak with languages. Tongues is the word, but I think a better word is languages. And magnify God. They were praising him. They meet. You know, this is what thrills us in the ministry. The other day I had a phone call. I can sometimes not remember whether it was a phone call or a letter. But a lady, now here's a phone call. She had been raised in a home absolutely destitute of anything spiritual or biblical. She said, we didn't have a Bible in the house. My parents never believed in God. They never went to church. Consequently, we kids didn't either. And she said, I went on into my teen years with that same mentality. Never had an interest in the things of God. Never questioned about him. She said, I married somebody pretty much of the same thinking. And she said, I went into the workaday world. And for years, she said, that was my life. No concept of God or eternity or anything. And then she said, one week I was home with an injury of some kind. She couldn't go to work. And she said, I was just flipping through the channel. And she said, I accidentally caught your program. Well, she said, it struck an interest. And she said, I watched every day for about two weeks. She had taped it after she went back to work so she could watch it when she got home. And she says, after two weeks, you just happened to put the plan of salvation on the program. And she said, I was saved instantly. And she said, from that time on, my whole life changed. My husband became a believer. Our home life changed. All because of believing the gospel. See, now that's the whole idea of Scripture. As soon as these Romans believed what Peter preached, even though it wasn't yet our gospel of grace, it was still the word of God. And God responded by just giving them an open heart to believe and to show the evidence 
of it. Now, of course, I can never teach chapter 10 without going back to chapter 2. And those of you who are with me all the time, you probably get tired of me doing this. But I like to compare Scripture with Scripture so that we see what a drastic difference between what happened here in this Gentile house from what happened on the day of Pentecost back there in Jerusalem. All right, and that's back at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And all I ask people to do is just use common sense and compare words with words. English with English, see? You're not comparing oranges and apples. We're comparing what took place over here at Pentecost with the Jew to what took place in the house of Cornelius, the Gentiles. And look at the complete inversion in the way God dealt with them. All right, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, here is Peter and his appeal to the nation of Israel on the day of Pentecost. Verse 38, Repent, Peter said, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And next step, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now look what happens in the house of Cornelius. Just compare the process. Verse 44 again, while Peter was yet speaking, he hadn't even stopped to make any kind of an invitation or an explanation. He is still in his message of who Jesus Christ really was. And the Holy Spirit fell on these Romans as an indication of their believing. And then these Jews just couldn't possibly comprehend what was taking place. But they understood that it was something real because they too spoke in languages and tongues just like they did back on Pentecost. But what hadn't they done yet? They hadn't repented. They hadn't gotten baptized. But they were believers. You see the difference? Plain as day. Now, of course, Peter in an afterthought says, well, now wait a minute. We missed it somehow or other. We should have baptized them first. But he didn't have a chance, see? God was way ahead of him. And so these Gentiles became believers by just simply believing. No repentance, no water baptism, nothing. Isn't that amazing? All right, so this is the whole concept now then of Peter going to the house of Cornelius. If you'll come back to chapter 10 of Acts, if you're not, well, come back now with me a minute. And uh, now I just drop down in chapter 11 because... I get so many questions on things in the book of Acts, and my stock answer is, you cannot use Acts for doctrine. Acts is an historical record of moving from Israel to the Gentile world. And there are so many things in here that get confusing, and when people try to use Acts for doctrine, they get all fouled up. They get all this other stuff that has no business being in our uh, faith system today. And so I repeat it over and over. Don't use these things in Acts as doctrine and say, well, this is what you have to do because this is what Peter said. This is what you have to do because this is what happened here because it just doesn't smooth out. Paul is going to take a Jewish vow. Paul is going to baptize and as I'm going to show you now in these succeeding programs, as soon as we get out of all this transitional stuff in the book of Acts, then we get into Paul's epistles, and then everything starts leveling up. But all right, back to our period of time with Peter yet in uh, now chapter 11. And remember, the basis of all of his operation is the Jewish church in Jerusalem, which is still all kingdom ground. All they've understood was who Jesus Christ was. Verse 1, chapter 11. And the apostles, the other 11, other than Peter, the apostles and brethren that were in Judea, that is Jerusalem, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they who were of the circumcision, that is this Jewish church, including the other 11 apostles, contended with him. 
My, they just called him on the carpet. Peter, what in the world were you doing in a house full of Romans? See? We have nothing to do with those people. All right? Verse 3. And they don't quit with the fact that he went up there, that he went in, and on top of everything else, he sat down and ate unclean food with them. Peter, how could you? See? And so... Verse 3, they said, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised. That was bad enough. But then you sat down and ate with them? Now, do you get the picture? They couldn't comprehend something like this. Now, when Peter comes back and rehearses all that happened, you see what God is doing? He is opening up the thinking of these Jews now to the fact that God is going to go and save Gentiles, not by bringing them into Judaism as proselytes, but he's going to save them by faith and faith alone now, not in just who Jesus was, but what Jesus has done. And that is the work of the cross. And that's where all the difference of the world comes in. And that's what sets Paul's ministry apart from Peter. As different as daylight is dark, even though they're dealing with the same Christ, yet Peter is dealing with the Christ of the earthly ministry, proclaiming to be the Messiah of Israel, and Paul knows nothing, as we're going to see in the next program, nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. All right, now let's just come down a little bit more in chapter 11. And verse 4, Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and he expounded it by order of them saying, and he rehearses the whole story. And uh, that kind of settles them down. But that doesn't really change their overall thinking because we're going to see later, if not today in our net of taping, we're going to see that when these Jerusalem Jews hear about Gentiles coming into salvation by way of Israel's God up there in Antioch, they're going to get all bent out of shape, just like they are here. And they're going to, again, take steps to root out any of these false teachers who could possibly think about bringing Gentiles into a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so as you see this in the book of Acts, just constantly remember the Jewish mentality that it was still all Jewish that Israel was alone the recipients of God's covenant promises. And on the other hand, we're getting ready to accept the fact that God is now going to go to the Gentile world without bringing them into Judaism. <laughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.